Well. Oh, yeah. thanks. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's get it all out. Everybody, get it out. We got. We <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I forgot it was my birthday. Yeah, you did for a second. Um, thank you guys all for coming out. I'm Krista Smith with Vanity Fair, and obviously, this is Bradley Cooper, and it's his birthday. Uh, and, and it's just such an honor and a privilege to be here and to get to spend the next hour with you and talk about your career conversation. Uh, and it's especially poignant for me because I'm in journalism, obviously, and, and uh, I am based in the West Coast, so I cover entertainment for Vanity Fair, and I have watched Bradley from pretty much, I think, I remember him in his one scene in Sex and the City, and kind of tracking, <laughs> tracking his career through Nip Tuck and Midnight Meat Train, and you know, all the way through. So you just got to see uh, some of the stuff that he does, but one of the things that comes to mind always with you uh, is range and versatility. Uh, no one can ever pin you down, and, and I've said this to you before, but for me, what really made you a leading man was when you put on the garbage bag in Silver Lines Playbook, and I was like, oh, now I get it. He's a leading man. Uh, but I wanna talk about Elephant Man, because this is a particularly, it's a clip you guys just saw, and I got to see that on Broadway, and it was spectacular. And this is something that I think for, since this is a room full of actors, this is really the, the nugget for you when you were a kid, and I've, I've read this before about you, that sitting in your house in Philly, you watched Elephant Man, and that was the moment where you were like, I wanna do that, I wanna be an actor. Yeah. You know, before before we talk about that, I just have to say um, I was listening to everything back in the side of the stage and the fact that you all are here and are interested in talking about that work means a lot to me. So thank you. That really means a lot. To me. And the fact that it's my birthday uh, is, is really kind of wonderful. When I was thinking, I thought, wow, I've ever thought a day would come where I would be able to sit in a room with fellow actors and talk about uh, the work. Well, wow, that's kind of wonderful. Um, so thank you for being here. I feel like we're just midway through the journey here <laughs> with you. Um, yes, the Elephant Man. Prism came into Philadelphia. That was a you know was a, a service you know HBO and Prism, and uh, they sh played movies uh, for. You know, so Elephant Man was on you know for like felt like a year, twice a day, and um, and I watched it uh, many times, and I, I I sort of got addicted to how emotionally how emotional it made me from the. Uh, the adagio for strings and and John Hurt's performance and David Lynch's direction and it really was the the one the first scene that gets me is when Anthony Hopkins comes in and you don't see Merrick and you just see that tear come down Treve's face as he as he takes in what the site is and we as the audience are with Anthony Hopkins and I think it was it was what Hopkins was doing but it was really what Lynch was doing how I, I was very aware of how he was manipulating me through the way he was telling the story cinematically so the truth the real truth is it, it, that was what crystallized for me that I wanted to be in that world I wanted to be a part of that world and I think the idea of directing was something I couldn't even f fathom consciously so I, I it, 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 but I, but it really was the love of storytelling uh, and um, and then and then the and then Merrick moved me so much um, I just started researching about him all the time, and I kind of became obsessed with uh, Joseph Merrick, was his real name. And, um, and yeah, that was the moment. You know, but a, a movie theater was across the street from my backyard. There was train tracks, then a movie theater. So I was very lucky. So I would always go to the movies. So it was really many movies, and my father was a huge cinephile. So really, films just became such a, a, a compartment for me to, to learn about life you know, as sad as that is, uh, but it really was, you know, I was, I was even thinking about that the other night, about how I felt like included in, in humanity because I would see things that I felt in my life up on screen in movies, and that's what made me feel like I belonged, really, were, were movies, almost as much as life. Uh, and I think that's why, if, to me, it feels like such a privilege to be in this profession to do that, to tell human stories so that people could feel the way that I felt, because it's given me a, a tremendous amount of nourishment, and I've learned a lot from watching movies uh, my whole, you know, most of my life. 
uh, you talk about your dad being a, a cinephile um, and sharing that experience with you, but he wasn't in the business, right? He was a stockbroker, I think. Or so for you, as uh, a young man, young like teenager, was it hard for you to say out loud, "I want to be an actor. This is what I want to do"? Was there any other? Oddly enough, no. And uh, I was made fun of all the time by my uncles uh, because when I saw the Elephant Man, that's when I declared it publicly <laughs> to the mirror and then to my family that uh, that I wanted to be an actor. Uh, and I remember even in high school, as I was applying to college, to a college that had no theater program and nothing. And, uh, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I just, I knew I wasn't ready. Uh, but I but I but I uh, it was never there was no doubt um, that I wanted to be an actor. And I, I was at an event the other night, and Regina King was speaking, and she was talking about how she wanted to be so many different things, and she realized what she really wanted to be was an actor. And I think that was really true, and I'm sure for true for a lot of you, uh, you know, you just wanted to be everything, and it changed by the week, sometimes by the hour. But in that hour, that was it. You were gonna be, you know, whatever that was gonna be. Um, so, so acting was the only way to somehow facilitate that odd urge. Yeah, and you and it feels like you went to Georgetown, obviously, as you said. Oh, not. and real quick, sorry to yeah. interrupt, but yes, I came from a background no one no one knew anything about movies in terms of having a a, a relationship to an actor or anything. Uh, my parents are both from Philadelphia, and my grandfather was a cop, a, a beat cop for thirty five years. That was my mother's father, and on the Italian side of my father's father was a fireman, and they actually knew each other because they, they had the same insurance, medical insurance, so they would be at the podiatrist together. Because <laughs> boots back then, you have a lot of foot problems. Uh, a little too much detail, but anyway. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but the odd thing is Robert De Niro, I, know, but I felt like I knew Robert De Niro. My uncle would talk about Robert De Niro like he was our, our cousin or something. <laughs> I mean, that was the, you, you felt, so you're like, ah, that, he sucked in that moment, but this one, he's great, and uh, the, oh, when he did that, you know what I mean? You're like, it was crazy, you know, and Al Pacino, these are all people that we felt like we knew who they were, that they were part of our, our literally our family, which was so odd, but I think that's, that's the, do you know what I'm talking about, though? Didn't it, that doesn't feel like you, that you knew them, um, so even though I was so removed, so removed, um, and theater was like Mars to me. I remember I went to the Forest Theater. It was the only, I saw like, Cats when I was like 15. It was the only like live thing I'd ever seen until I got to grad school, basically. Um, uh, so theater was something I, that I had no connection to. And then once I plunged into it, fell madly in love with it. Um, anyway, so yeah. Well. And then you went to the Georgetown. Act, right. Well, you yeah. were at Georgetown, right? Where you were an English major, and you did yeah. very well. So obviously, you're very studious. When you made that journey, well, to I didn't get in out of high school. I applied, I got rejected, and then I reapplied. I transferred. I transferred there from Villanova, actually. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. But but I think that was one of the best things that ever happened to me, uh, because I was rejection? pretty rejection. Yeah, the rejection. I was pretty devastated, and um, and I was I just I was just so myopic in wanting to go there, and I just tried again and then got in. I think once I got there, I felt like I didn't really deserve to be there, so that made me work really hard. So I would never have done as well as I did academically, I think, if I had gotten in out of high school. So it wound up being a blessing. That's kind of going to be a euphemism for your career as we go along in this conversation, I have a feeling. <laughs> but when you got to New York, why did you choose the actor studio? Um, again, uh, yeah, I did have. I did. I knew. I knew nothing about acting schools or anything. The only thing I'd heard is there's this Yale Drama School, which said, which was, which you know, that's all I. I didn't even know what that meant. So I remember. I remember when I was meeting with your. I was this guy, Father Noth at Georgetown, talking about what are you going to do after undergraduate, and I was like, you know, I think I'll uh, go to Yale Drama School <laughs> after Georgetown. Like no idea that like they let 15 people in and there's no chance in hell I'd ever get in. Um, I was like, I'll do that, or uh, and then and then and then as and then that was like my sophomore year, and then by senior year, I was in actually a program that I had to write a thesis, so I couldn't apply to those schools, which of course I wouldn't have gotten into. And the actor studio had just started this MFA program, I think two years prior. And the truth is they were doing that to fund the actor studio. James Lipton started it because Paul Newman stopped giving money to the actor studio and they were going broke. And the news, it was a, so it was this great idea, let's create this MFA program that will bring revenue to keep the studio alive. Um, 
And so I, I just benefited from a school that they were letting a lot of people in, they were letting like 80 people in, but I was taught by Susan Batson, Ellen Burstyn, Arthur Penn. I mean, it was ridiculous that the people that I was taught by at that school, um, and they had rolling admissions, so I was able to do my thesis and then apply late. And so that's how, so, and a friend of mine was going there uh, to another part of the new school, and she said, you know, there's rolling admissions, so I thought, oh, okay. At least I'll get my feet wet with an application, and may, even if I don't get in, I'll take a year off. I thought I'd work as an intern at the Schubert Theater in Philly and then apply to Yale Drama School, still not knowing that I wouldn't get in. Um, and so, so, and I remember uh, the audition was, uh, and the, the, uh, there was an audition, and I actually asked a Carmelite priest who was a professor at Georgetown to do the audition with me who wasn't an actor. Um, and, uh, and, and we did a scene from Mass Appeal. And, I, and we took the train from D.C. into New York, and then we were rehearsing at Washington Square Park, and I remember a cop came up because it's a scene where he hits me. And they were like, no, 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 we're just acting. And then uh, we did the audition. They thought Andrew was auditioning. I remember they said, are you Bradley Cooper? And he was like, no, no, this guy is. And, uh, and then I got in, and then, um, and then, you know, that was it, yeah. And thank God for that. How how different were you as a person when you got in to when you came out? Oh, that's interesting. Uh, the same amount of enthusiasm, um, just uh, a tremendous amount of knowledge. I knew nothing when I got, I, I did a play at Georgetown where I cried like a baby in one scene and I was so happy and thrilled with myself, thinking that like, this is it, I was right at 12, <laughs> only to be told when the notes session the next day from the director how horrible that scene was and how I stopped saying the lines and that the audience was very uncomfortable because it looked like I was in pain. Uh, and I, I realized I knew nothing. I had no idea how to, how to do anything other than the love of the, the want to learn how to do it. And um, I, I had an incredible teacher there, Elizabeth Kemp, in the first year. They said, they, they really, I, I love that program, and uh, I just went back and talked to the students there, and they're wonderful. It's now at Pace University. Um, but, you know, it was split up into three years, and basic tech was the first year, and it was all about opening up your instrument. The second year was about analyzing a script, and the third year was putting those two together, and then you have a thesis, which was The Elephant Man for me. It was a 30-minute version of it that we would then do a week run uh, at, a, at the, the downtown circle in the square that was then on Bleecker Street. Um, and so it, it was really just, a, I, I had the toolbox after I left there uh, when I graduated in 2000. And that was just, you know, I, I mean, that's what I use till this day. But I kept the same love, you know, that, that's, it, that did not wane. In fact, it increased. I finally met people actually who I, I, I could talk to movies about. I only had my buddy Brian Klugman that I've known since I'm 10 years old. I just spent my birthday with him. Uh, I hope the Cowboys lost. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I left the game. Um, <laughs> big game tomorrow, Eagles tomorrow. Um, yeah, let's get the Bears. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> um, so, so all I have is Brian Klugman to watch Apocalypse Now and Deer Hunter and all those movies and Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner as a kid and my father. Uh, so then all of a sudden I'm, I'm, I'm plotted down in New York City with Gabe Fazio and Luca Perucci and all these guys in my grad school who I love and were you know, out all night in bars talking about movies and plays. So it was really a wonderful, a wonderful moment of feeling like I was I with people that I, I've been searching for my whole adolescence. Well, so since you brought up football, I'm gonna ask you this. So when you were on Broadway, which gave you more satisfaction as a person, bringing Elephant Man to Broadway or Eagles winning the Super Bowl? <laughs> You can't ask me that question. <laughs> that is just not fair. Because I don't like that I don't know the answer to yeah. that. <laughs> There's something wrong with me. <laughs> oh, it's so good, right? Uh, well, I want to talk a little bit about the craft, since we are in a room full of actors, and holding that line through a course of a career and the ups and downs of a career and... Uh, peaks and valleys, as it were, because you came out of of the actor studio and you got some jobs and some works. And I, you talked about a Wendy's commercial the last time we spoke about how that was like I've made it, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. uh, and then Alias and whatnot. So, what sustained you through that? Uh, That's a very good question. You know, 
Yeah, it's so funny. I was just at the AFI. The, every year they do this uh, thing where they name the best ten movies and, or that they choose to put into their catalog. And uh, someone tapped me on my shoulder, and it was Ken Olin. And Ken Olin was the showrunner in Alias. And this is 2000. So I came out here in two. Th we shot the pilot before 9/11. And then 9/11, and then and then I came, and then we started shooting the series right after that. And Ken Olin was the director of many of the episodes, and I was so curious about how how it was made. So I and he so I was literally like an albatross to him for a year, and I would just spend all my time in his office, and then like in the editing rooms, I would ask to get all the dailies back, and I would I remember asking him about like how do you figure out how to shoot a scene? I mean, there's so many possibilities. And he was really, um, he was wonderful. He's, a, he's hard. He's, 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 no, he's no bullshit. Um, so it was, he, he, you know, it wasn't like he was, you know, very gentle with me. Um, but, but he did allow me to be around. And uh, the fact that I saw him yesterday, and I thought, what a journey. You know, because I, I like left slash got fired off of Alias. Uh, probably more the, the latter. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I was so depressed, you know, I, I was working like three days a week and I just thought, oh my gosh, like very, very depressed. I, I really thought, oh, this is not going to happen. Um, and that was a, it sort of took my breath away. Because all you go on is hope and faith, right? That's it. And it's like, and you try to grab it from wherever you can. And when it's hard to find those places to grab it from, it gets fucking scary. Especially when you have no plan B. And I never had a plan B ever. Uh, I knew at that moment when I was a kid uh, that this was it. Um, so it was kind of life or death is the way it felt, those moments. Um, I assume you guys feel know what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? So so uh, I'm always so happy when um, you watch award shows and you see great actors talk with, about our profession with respect. It makes me so happy, you know? When people are like, because I find it even, you know, I have to say, even listening to that backstage, I was like, fuck, man, like, yeah, I definitely showed my soul in some of that stuff. You know, that's, that's what we do. It's, I, I find it, I really, I think it's a privilege to do what we do uh, because it really calls something upon us to be naked in front of people for them. Yeah. It's for them. You know, we're, you're, we're doing it for them. We're trying to tell stories. Well, it's like what you said when you watch a movie and you feel something and it teaches you something about your life. That's what I think is so unique to this profession is you mirror the world back to itself and you allow people to feel things and think about things in such a different way that they wouldn't have maybe before. Uh, and that's... And the only way to do that is to be honest. And that's what's so hard, you know? And that's, that's what people react to is when, oh, they really feel like that character is going through it. You know, and and that that's what takes a you know a piece of our flesh. Um, so yeah, I yeah I agree with you. So so what got me through it? Um, faith, um, uh, st stubborn, um, luck uh, that I that, that I kept getting breaks every now and then. Um, people then 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 major things. You know, major things like. The first one was J.J. Abrams taking a chance with me, and then I'd say it was David Dobkin, because after Alias, I, mean, I remember going in auditions, they're like, you know, he's just so nice, he's so nice. Wow, Bradley's very nice. I don't think he can, there's no edge. There's really no edge. I remember hearing that, no edge, what the fuck? You're from Philly, <laughs> no it's all edge. <laughs> but then, then the yeah. crazy thing about that, I know you can relate to this too, I think they, they're like, no edge, you're right, I don't have any edge, that's right, because I was blonde here and blue-eyed in an Italian family, I never looked like my cousins, people thought I was a girl till I was eight, you know, like, people say that and you're like, they're right, they're right, I don't have any edge, you know, so it, it's such this mind fuck that happens. Um, uh, but then David Dobkin took a chance on Wedding Crashers, and I was able to play this guy and be in a, in a world with, um, thank you. Moment for Wedding Crashers. You stole every scene in that movie. It was so great. That was such a fun, fun role, and you were so believable in it. And that's, I want you to talk a little bit about this, too, because what's, for me, looking at your work and seeing, you know, the versatility in it, one thing remains the same. No matter how small or seemingly insignificant or how huge, you always approach everything with the same amount of energy and focus and almost gratitude. Mm -hmm. You have no judgment which I think is really important for actors and especially ones that 
have longevity in their careers. And to me, I don't see that that often. And you're someone that I've seen that from consistently. Thank you. Uh, um, no judgment of the characters? No judgment of the of the characters, no judgment of the role, no judgment of the like. You I mean, like, no matter yourself, how small, whatever yeah, approach it, I think that just has, that comes down to pure love of doing it. You know, I'm very lucky that I love it so much. Um, there's no way you can go through a career, no matter who you are, uh, if you don't love it. I remember, you know, Anthony Hopkins was doing movies of the week before Silence of the Lambs. You know, I remember watching like a Jackie Collins movie on like CBS, and he was like having. Uh, 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 like it's like hanky panky in a plane with somebody under sheets, and that was Anthony Hopkins. You know what I mean? And, and by the way, I would have killed to have that role if I thought, well, movie of the week. I mean, you know. But like for him, you know. So it's like no one has an. There's no. I don't know any career that's just like that. Certainly, if you want to have longevity, um, so you better love it, because it's it's all about you know it not working until it does, and people you know looking past you until they don't. You know. Um, and the other exciting thing is that you never know when it's gonna happen. That's the other thing. You could have your head in the ground for, for, for four years and all of a sudden someone says, you know what, this, you're perfect for this, and all of a sudden everything changes. So there's this something very exciting about that. There's always hope, you know, there's always hope. And now the wonderful thing about so much content out there, there's so many ways for people to see the work. I mean, it's incredible. It's just incredible. On your phone, on your computer, in the theater, and anywhere, it, it is. It's it's a disruption that I that to me I feel like leaning into it. It's given us so much more. It, it's available to everybody anywhere. And I look at my kids responding to stuff they never would have responded to before. I mean, I remember waiting and having to sit through the commercials and Sunday. Just night. see, just just so much more, sh so many more uh, stories being told. So there's just so much more work for us. That, that's, there's just so many more shows, really wonderful shows, and it's crazy. So along on the way, like we were talking about Wedding Crashers, what did you learn watching Vince Vaughn? Oh, I'm so glad you asked that. I learned a major thing. I, I, it's so yeah, I mean, Vince Vaughn kind of changed the way I looked at acting in film. Pure, like huge, like, you know, diamond to the skull awakening moment. Watching him, I remember exactly the scene. It's when he comes out when grandmom's trying to kill him with the shotgun. And he comes running out of the house. And I don't even think my character was there. I can't remember. Uh, but I remember watching him, and he, and then he's, that's when he sort of confesses to loving Isla's character, Gloria. And um, so, he, you know, every take he was, you know, we're, we're, we're down by where he's going to wind up. I remember, and you hear the shotgun or whatever, the, and then he comes barreling out. And he just did it different every time. And he was doing this like jazz thing. He started like singing to her. It was crazy. And he was so free. And this big man, in quotes, you know, manly man to me, you know, who's like the quick, at that time, he was like no one. He was a slayer. No one could touch him. You know, he was like the king. Um, and for him to be that vulnerable and willing to, because not all of it worked, you know, and you're like, I just can't believe how bold this guy is in those like plaid pants and a pink shirt, by the way, doing it or whatever it was. And, 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 and I remember thinking like, oh yeah, you really have to be willing to fail. That's, you really, and I look at Vince Vaughn, I'm watching Vince Vaughn, who I sort of look up like this from Swingers, uh, like who's the coolest cat in the world, just falling in his face, getting back up, trying it again, and with zero, it would look to me, had zero, um, you know, uh, thinking about what he was doing, what's that word, you know? Consciousness, self-consciousness. There was no self-consciousness at all. And I remember thinking like, oh, that's how you get the gold. Oh, you, and, and by the way, he didn't get fired. I also realized like, oh, the director wasn't going, why are you doing that? You know, it was like, oh, this is part of the process. Oh, okay, okay, this is part of the process. Um, and I don't know if that was because when I was on a television, it was so fast and we had to do so many pages and I always felt like there was no room to, to for me, at, at least that's, and it was just what I was in my mind. I thought I have to get it right, whatever, which means nothing, by the way. Um, there is no such thing. So to be able to watch this wonderful artist who I also had, you know, had held up to this like idea of what I thought a man was, being so vulnerable and willing to fail was very, it was like, blew the doors off of what I what I thought the process of acting in film is and acting in general and and really from that moment on it really changed me as an actor uh, 
Uh, and let's talk about when you first met Robert De Niro, actually, the real Robert De Niro. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I have a crazy history with Robert De Niro. Um, he came to our school, and I had a question for him, uh, because I, I, I remember one of my favorite movies at that time was Awakenings, and I wanted to ask him this very specific question about um, this tick that he had the character doing that, to me, just like summed up everything. It was such a powerful moment, and I wanted to ask him, mean, and I was so embarrassed that maybe he would think what, it was a stupid question. And I remember, they, 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 and I never asked questions ever because I hated that they had, they made you say like I'm so and so I'm on the acting track and so I was like I can't say that stuff. <laughs> I don't know why I just felt like I felt feel like an idiot saying that stuff. So but so they're like two people. But I but I was like I have to ask Robert Neal this question. I, I have to do it. Uh, and then like r so the one person asked. I think they would do like three questions and then. The second person got up and I thought, well, maybe that's a stupid question. You know what, I'm gonna ask him some question about the mission. Like, did he know how to ride a horse before the movie? <laughs> like some stupid question that I didn't care about. And the person right before me says, so in the mission, uh, when you're riding the horse, and I thought, oh my God. And then so it was my question and I had to ask him the real question. And, um, and he's not very uh, verbose uh, during the whole interview. And, and not really even looking at James Lipton at all uh, during the interview. And then I, I still remember it. He was like, I asked him the question, and he's like. <laughs> and he went like this. I remember he went, that's a good question. <laughs> and I was like, that's a good question? Yeah. And it was like a light shot through me. And I'm not kidding. And talk about the hope, like things to grab onto. I grabbed onto that moment for years. <laughs> I'm not kidding, for fucking years. I was like, you know what? I risked it, and Robert De Niro said it was a good question. I'm not going to give up. And I asked the school if I could have a tape of it, because they didn't put it in the show, that question. And, and they said, uh, 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 okay. And they only gave me a copy of the real bird's eye view of it, where you see like the whole theater. But I had it. I had that VHS thing that I would watch sometimes. I know it's so sad. It's so sad, but we use whatever we can, man, to keep going. Did he ever answer the question? Or did he, he did. He said, okay. I didn't see anybody do that, but uh, yeah, he, this, he, this is exactly, I think he went, yeah, no, no, I didn't see anybody do that, but um, yeah, that's a good question. That's what he said, that's yeah. That's good. Yeah. That's so funny. Yeah. Uh, well, for you, in speaking of physical and ticks and whatnot, the Elephant Man was so physical, eight days yeah. a week. There was no prosthetics. It was all you. It was the breathing, the voice, the, I mean, what you saw there, obviously you got a good indication of what it was like, but to sit in the theater for two plus hours and to watch you carry that uh, and watch the physicality and the, mo and the emotion of the, every bit of that play, and as an actor, you're doing that eight days a week. It's not like a movie. Right, you're not like taking a break and going to get to craft and having a snack while they turn the, you know, you're you're out there present. How do you prepare for that and then sustain that over that period of time? Well, I had the I had the huge advantage of having done it in grad school, the half hour version of it, and I like. I remember I, I bought a, a, a ticket to London and I'd never been to London before and I spent four days there and I went to the hospital and, and did all this research and just walked around and and so I really learned, I did quite a bit back then in 1999. So then um, fast forward to 2011 or 12, I thought, Oh, I love Williamstown. It's a great theater festival. And I, and I thought, oh, let's, I, Scott Ellis, I had become friends with, who's a great theater director. I said, I got this crazy idea of doing The Elephant Man. He was like, oh, no, 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 I don't, I don't think. He's like, you know, they just did that because Billy Crudup had just done it and it's, it's not a good play and I don't, I don't know. And I was like, oh, and then, so I asked Victor Garber, who I had met on Alias, I said, what about playing trees? He's like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Bradley, don't do that. And I thought, no, nah, I got to do it. I got to do it. And then, thank God, Patty Clarkson said yes. Who I, When I met her, I actually said, if I ever do The Elephant Man, would you ever play Mrs. Kendall? Um, and I think she thought I was like, what? What are you talking about? Uh, so we wound up doing that at Williamstown, which was wonderful. And it really, because I thought, look, if it's horrible and people are laughing at me, at least, you know, it's Williamstown and maybe we'll get away with it. <laughs> really, that's what we thought. And, 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 um, and we did it, and it, and it wasn't horrible. Uh, and that, that you do a three-week rehearsal and a two-week run there, so it's five weeks of the summer, and it really worked. 
And uh, and then it really was about taking that all those people, even the people, because it's all run by students, all of them to Broadway, um, and then doing the show. And it, we, we didn't we didn't do it for I think two years later, but kept the whole cast except except two people weren't available. Um, and uh, so by the time I got to do it on Broadway, I'd done two versions of it over a span of like ten years. So that's really a kind of wonderful relationship with the character. Um, and uh, and it grew every time, and we did a run in New York, and then we did a run in London. So and we think we wound up doing 398 performances all together. And um, it did take a toll on uh, my body. My my uh, my right hand got pretty messed up, and the left side of my face got larger than the right side. To this day, actually, <laughs> if you if you look at a photo, I shouldn't say it, but you, you'll see. <laughs> and um, yeah, because my whole the mouth was like that, and. Um, but I love him so much, uh, that, ca uh, that man who lived in the late 1800s, and I respect him so much. And I think it was, and that was the first per time I'd ever played a human being who had existed on this earth, and that privilege is immeasurable. Um, so I, it was the love of him, of, of Merrick, that I think, I never, I didn't feel, t I mean, I honestly didn't, f I, the, the play would end and I didn't, f I wanted to keep doing it after London, quite honestly. I did, I, I love it. Uh, I mean, he died at 26, so you know I'm 44 today. So, uh, but I would—I'm not even kidding. I would still love to do it. I would love to do a run of it. And I actually talked to Patty recently about should we do like a, a, a as like a small run of it or something. And how different was your final performance in London to that first performance? So different. Days? Oh yeah, and and Alessandro Navola, who played uh, uh, Frederick Treves, we talked about a lot, and we, we we never stopped trying to make it better and exploring. I mean, especially him. I have to say, he has this huge monologue at the end of the play, and he was like screaming and thumping around. By the time we did the final performance in London, and I remember my characters upstage looking up, I was crying because I was so moved at how bold he was. Because we were just, we would work on it every day and talk about. So, well, do you have to yell? Well, why are you yelling? Like, what are you actually saying? What's going on? And that last performance, I don't think he's yelled once. So, th the, the uh, you know, the the for him to like take a chance and work on something in front of 880 people was so moving to me. Um, so he really, he really got dug deeper and deeper with Treves. Um, okay, so Todd Phillips. Hangover. Hangover, that movie, <laughs> still holds up. <laughs> still holds up, yeah. You see some scenes, and you're, I was looking at it, uh, just knowing that I was gonna talk to you, I was looking at a couple of clips, I was like la actually laughing, remembering his very, very funny moments. Uh, but after that, I, I remember from a journalist's point of view, like everything changed for you. Suddenly Bradley Cooper's world and we were just kind of living in it. Uh, and you did the, obviously you had the sequels to it. But was most interesting to me after that moment was the choices you made were really risky from the standpoint of like, wow, he's gonna work with David O. Russell, who I think is a mad genius, but he's also a little mad, and you never know, it's not a guarantee, you just don't know. Um, and I thought it was so, I'd like for you to just talk to, to everybody, um, but for me personally, that question, it, it's so interesting to watch what someone does once they've hit that success, or when they have so many choices, what are the choices that you make? Um, Todd Phillips, one of the examples of someone who, uh, you know, where you're waiting for that hope that, you know, that's someone to believe in you. I was pl doing a play called um, The Understudy in Williamstown, and I had met Todd Phillips for The Hangover like s four or five months earlier. And um, I think they had cast it, and then the, the actors didn't want to do it. So we, we were kind of like the Bad News Bears crew of The Hangover that finally got cast. Um, but I was gonna give. I was gonna give after the understudy. I was gonna quit and and not do acting anymore. Um, and and he emailed me while I was at Williamstown and said, "Let's do the movie." And I, I thought it was a joke. I thought it was one of my friends who pulled a joke. And that so that was one of those moments. Um, and then we wound up doing it. While we were filming it, I remember thinking, "Well, there's something about this movie that's very special." Because uh, we didn't even know if it was a comedy. We would like be eating at night in Vegas, going like, "What is this movie like?" <laughs> This naked guy just jumped out of a trunk, and it was funny, but it was also really weird and scary. <laughs> and it hurt a lot. <laughs> 
grown man on your net on your shoulders, you know, hitting you with a crowbar, uh, naked. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, so, 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 and, and um, so he was one of the people that really, and to this day, we're partners now. And uh, and I can't believe uh, that he's one of my best friends. I never would have thought that that evolution would have ever happened. And I can't wait for you to see the movie he just did. I mean, I think it's going to be really something. Um, but um, yeah. Yeah, a lot of opportunity. That was definitely, I definitely felt that. And and I have to say, I think it's part of like, you know, the luck. I did a movie called The A-Team, which I think was after Hangover 1, if I'm correct. Yeah. And um, playing a character called Face. Now that to me was like uh, so weird because I thought, oh, that I really have to act in order for this to, to pull this off. And it was really trying to do something that I did not feel connected to at all. And um, and I think if that movie had worked, I think it would have been really bad for me as an actor. And I actually think it was a huge blessing that, that movie didn't work. Um, honestly, you know, because I wasn't really, I never felt, I was like trying, and that's why I think I got so ripped, because I was like, I, mean, I don't have such a great face, so maybe I'll just work out a lot. Um, but I'm serious, I'm just being honest with you. Um, and, um, and it didn't work, and then uh, Neil Berger had this movie called Dark Fields that I thought was incredible. And I had auditioned for it a long time ago, and Heath Ledger was going to do it, and he passed away. And then they changed it to Limitless. Um, and um, uh, uh, Dixon, a uh, great writer, wrote who wrote Mrs. Doubtfire, wrote that script. And, um, and for some reason, they took a chance to cast me in Limitless. And that really was the first time that I felt like I really had an opportunity to do something that, that I was very excited about as an actor in a real way. And that was the first time I worked with Robert De Niro. Um, so that movie was a huge thing. The fact that that movie worked uh, was a major, major thing. It made a lot of money, and they, they th we thought they didn't think you know it was a, it was a studio that never had a hit. I don't think, and uh, and there was nobody in it really except for Robert De Niro, and um, and it was an uh, quirky sort of thing, and a, and a budget that the studios weren't making movies for that budget, and uh, I remember they were thinking it was going to open to like fourth. It was like and and it did really well, way beyond what they thought. So that really provided a huge opportunity. And that was your first lead. Right. Well, Midnight Me Train was the first lead. <laughs> oh, what? Midnight Me Train, right, which I mentioned already. <laughs> which yeah. I have to say was a wonderful experience because Ruhe Kitamura, uh, who was the director, was so collaborative. And I, and that was the first time I was able to really be, a, I felt like I was really a part of the storytelling with him. And, and I actually liked that movie a lot. And, yeah, uh, no. and I got to meet Vinnie Jones, who I love, and, uh, and Leslie Bibb, who's a great actor. Um, and, and there were other great actors in that movie. Um, but yeah, here's the thing. I, I, it's always been clear to me what I want to do. I just want to grow. I just want to become better. And so the idea of um, playing the same person, character makes no sense. It, it's not even, I wouldn't even, I, I couldn't do it, I don't think. Um, so I've always wanted to, whatever opportunity I could, to play different things to, to, to do it. And how much did you grow as an actor working with David O? Oh, tr I mean... Not only as an actor, as a person, uh, you know, he he invited me into his process to such a huge degree. Um, there's no way I would have wrote and directed *Stars Born* if I hadn't done three movies with David o. Russell. No way that I would have thought, you know what? I think I can do this. That there's no way that would have happened. He's just so wonderful. Uh, I found a, a real chemistry with him, uh, actor to director, uh, in a way that I felt like I could really. Um, go on the field and do what's happening in his head. Uh, and I think that he felt that for me, and it was a really wonderful relationship, and is a wonderful relationship. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't say enough about that. But, you know, Place Beyond the Pines was right before that, and I learned a lot from Derek C. in France. He's incredible also. Yeah, there was this run for you right in, like, 2000 and eight and 2009 there was like a lot of movies came out and you mentioned the midnight mean train i remember every actor auditioning for that and it was like oh bradley cooper got that oh. yeah that was i remember clocking that moment uh <laughs> which is so that. funny but it's just a funny title of a movie and yeah. it's fun to say over and over again but <laughs> um, it was released in a hundred one dollar theaters yeah <laughs> that was the release of that movie oh really yeah one hundred one dollar theaters <laughs> I was like, is that like a, is that like a platform? Uh, <laughs> really? Then you're going wide, what, in December? <laughs> no, I didn't even know what that meant then. But, but I remember thinking, oh, that's uh, not good. That's yeah, not good. Yeah. Uh, f 
working with so many different directors, and I have visited sets before with uh, David O. Russell, as I said earlier, I'm a fan of his, I'm friendly with him, and he's like screaming at his actors and talking to his actors while the cameras are rolling. Like, how do you focus and, and stay on point working with him? And then I, we're gonna talk about a couple of other big directors you've worked with, but. Um, I, 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 th I think it comes down to love again. It's all about love, and I never, in all the times I've worked with him, I ever felt that he was coming from a different place than from love, and love of telling the story that he's trying to get out of him, of here and here, on on to the set, and then have it so we can edit it. Uh, I so because I felt that from him, and that it was all with love, I was willing to go wherever he wanted me to go. Um, if I ever felt that he wasn't coming from love, which he never did, but I've been in, on sets when I felt that from a director that it was coming from a place of ego or I don't know what's happening, uh, I just shut down, you know, immediately. It's like, um, I just, you can't, I, I don't know how to, uh, again, getting back to what I was saying in the beginning, you know, how can you give a part of your soul if you're not in an environment that you feel comfortable? I, I can't do it. Um, I've, I've been in a pl situation doing a play where I lost 18 pounds in rehearsal because I felt that thing and I thought I'm not going to be able to do this and it was it was horrific and I'll, it'll never be that bad again. I remember saying I'll, it'll never be that bad again and I never let it be that bad again. Um, so, so with him, for me as an actor, it was wonderful um, because to me it was always so clear. I mean, you look in his eyes to me and you know that it's love. It's just always coming from love. Um, and he's a wonderful director, wonderful director. And you got two nominations off of, you know, uh, obviously in Silver Linings and then again in American Hustle. Uh, and you worked with, you, you talk about, um, you know, we've talked a lot about the men that you've worked with. Uh, what about the women? I mean, Jennifer Lawrence has been amazing. Amy Adams. I think about your your co-stars. I've been lucky from the beginning. I have to say, the first job I ever had was with Sarah Jessica Parker on Sex yeah. in the City, and then I got to work with Rachel McAdams and Wedding Crashers and Jennifer Garner and right. Alias, and then Julia Roberts on Broadway, and then in uh, Valentine's Day and Scarlett Johansson and Jennifer Connelly, and he's just not that into you. I mean, I've literally worked it's with the most, and then Emma Stone and Aloha, and obviously Sienna Miller, who I just think mm -hmm. is the greatest, and Lady Gaga and Jennifer Lawrence. I mean, I've worked with incredible yeah. women, incredible. And have you learned from them along the way as well? Nothing, no. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, you know, Julia Roberts, was, well, first of all, Jennifer Garner, uh, I learned so much from because I was just, I just, first of all, I watched somebody go from being like a theater actor in, into a star in a year. You know, she like, I watched that thing happen. It was like, holy shit. Um, up with Alias, because it was a big deal, and at least it felt that way to us, you know, and she was like all of a sudden on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine and doing Steven Spielberg's movie, it's seen with Leonardo DiCaprio, and I was like, the, I remember like shooting the pilot on at UCLA around the track. She was like a girl that w in a scrunchie that was like walking around, you know, absolutely, it was the, that role catapulted her into Star Yeah, so that was quite a thing to witness, and to see the grace with which mm -hmm. she handled that, and, main t and stay who she is, was from the person that like baked cookies for me when I arrived to LA, you know, that never mm -hmm. changed uh, that and, and getting a, a, a car uh, every Friday, she would have a, uh, you know, like a truck come for the set. And she said, she got, we all went to Disneyland for the rap party of the first season of Alias, you know, just always thinking about other people uh, blew me away. Uh, I learned a lot. Julia Roberts is just a powerhouse. She had never done a play before, and she does Three Days of Rain on Broadway, and and we got eviscerated. You know, it was not well reviewed, and I'll never forget. Like, and I thought, oh Jesus! And the day I'll never forget the day after. I remember. I remember um, James Gandolfini sent this like beautiful. I probably shouldn't tell this story though, but beautiful bouquet of flowers with a huge like supersada in there, and he's like, shove that up the reviewer's ass. And I thought he's the best. It was amazing, and um, and and uh, and she showed up the next day, the next night after the opening night, and it like, like just like nothing, and did it with joy, and we had an amazing run. And I thought, wow, I was like, wow, because there was a lot of pressure on her to do that, you know. It was like, uh, and she was wonderful in it for me. Uh, I, I loved working with her, uh, so she taught me a lot. Rachel McAdams. I just, again, you know, there was somebody, Wedding Crashers, she catapulted. It was, again, watching somebody like, 
you know, all of a sudden just like burst out. Um, I was amazed at what a wonderful actor she is. I remember being in the scenes with her like, wow, she's really present. I better like listen to what she's saying because uh, she's actually talking to me. <laughs> I better stop acting because she's really waiting for me to talk to her. And uh, <laughs> I should stop acting right now. Um, uh, Jennifer Lawrence was like watching um, somebody who has talent dripping off of their hands and doesn't like there's she was 21 years old and she just like has all this talent and we were shooting for like two weeks and she came on I think we were or a week and she came on and I remember David O. Russell and I looking at each other after first take and like oh my god like and she got his rhythm really fast and she's so smart and understands story and everything and and then just to watch her grow again I watched somebody else just like skyrocket because um, Hunger Games hadn't come out yet, but she had shot the first one. And I remember being in, because then we, she and I did a movie right after that called Serena. We were in Prague together and it still hadn't come out yet. Um, and then watching with the character she created in American Hustle and then to, to take a whole movie on her shoulders and joy, you know, it was really incredible. Uh, and Emma Stone to me is one of the greatest people I've ever met in my life. I love Emma so much. Oh, and Sandra Bullock, I got to meet, I got to work with her too. Everybody. It's kind of amazing. All right. Well, I want to ask you about Clint Eastwood uh, before we go to Star is Born. Uh, he couldn't be more different, obviously, than, than David or Russell or De Niro or anybody. He's such a unique individual. And he, he has said before that you have reminded him a lot of, of himself as a young man, as a young artist. And uh, you guys seem to have... He said that. that he, yeah, like, oh, wow, yeah, I don't, yeah I don't, he said that's that. That's awesome. Yeah, no, he said that. <laughs> <laughs> he did, and he actually talked about it, that you remind him a lot uh, of himself and your curiosity about every aspect. Oh, maybe the key, yeah, right. And about your... And, and I, we could all witness this, too. You're, you have the childlike innocence still about every part of your job in this business, really. Uh, even starting a production company and developing material and doing television and you know it's it's like I said earlier uh, but what is it about you and Clint um, what can you share with us about that experience of working with him um. and getting someone I guess like him to see you well, I had auditioned for everything he had ever done. He was one of those people that I thought, um, again, that we thought we knew at home. Um, Clint Eastwood was one of those people <laughs> with Unforgiven, you know, and Gene Hackman, too. We knew Gene Hackman. He was like, he was another uncle I had, right? Um, I mean, Unforgiven was one of those movies that, um, that you know, infected me in a way that, uh, I, you know, I, I, it's just I couldn't believe it. you know when you watch a movie you're like I can't believe there were cameras it just feels like some magical lens was there capturing something that really happened um, you know so so he was like a major like a, for all of us or a lot of us I'm sure you know really just kind of a daunting figure to me and then also I always also knew in the back of my mind that he had waited to direct until he was 40, play Misty for me. It came out, I think, when he was 41, but I think he was 40 or 41 when he actually did it. Um, and, and then that he was a jazz player, then he made a living playing the piano, and then, he, you know, he was a Depression-era kid, and, like, you know, his story is just so, so crazy. Uh, and then he was a television, that he was, like, bopping around, and, like, was, and he didn't hit it till he was older, you know. And, uh, Rawhide, it happened later, and then, the, the, you know, the Spaghetti Western's the thing that brought him back, but he didn't, like, come onto the scene and, like, become a huge star. He really paid his dues. That people, I don't know if people realize that, you know. And Robert De Niro also, not somebody who just skyrocketed the minute he came. It wasn't until 35, I think, until he did the Taxi Driver, I think, or Mean Streets. Um, so I just, so, so I loved him and I always wanted to work with him. So I auditioned for everything and he never met actors, at least in my experience. You always had to put yourself on tape. So I just put myself on tape for Flags of Our Fathers and uh, Grant Trina to play the Irish priest and to play J. Edgar's lover in uh, J. Edgar and uh, never got anything. And um, and I thought, but I always felt like maybe it was going to happen. And then and then um, uh, he was going to do A Star is Born. And, and um, I don't know if somebody fell out or something or, or he had an idea to meet me. And so I went and met him. And that, I think that was the first time I met him and walked into his you know bungalow and there's a piano and then it's fucking Clint Eastwood sitting on the couch. And I was like, I cannot believe it in his sneakers and like looking exactly like Clint Eastwood. And, uh, and then he was so 
cool. He was so present and like, and I all of a sudden I felt comfortable the same way that Robert De Niro made me feel comfortable, less comfortable. Clint made me feel more comfortable. <laughs> um, nothing against Bob. He just is like a little disconnect, you know, whatever that is. But, um, but, but, but Clint was like so just warm and like, and I it was like, right, he looked like a jazz musician, which is what he is. And, um, and I just thought, oh, he's the greatest guy in the world. And it didn't work out then. Uh, and then I was going to do a, a sniper. And then it was actually Greg Silverman who said, you know, Clint may want to do this. And then we wound up doing American Sniper. And it was just more of that, that that initial meeting I had with him. That's the way, that's the guy that I know today. Like, you know, he's come over to my house. And I remember he came over to my house and he like parked down the street. He's like walking up the street. You know, we went to visit Taya Kyle in, in Texas. And he's like, you know, let's go visit Taya. And I was like, so I figured it was going to be like, I don't know, I wouldn't even see him. And it was like me and him, we checked into the days in. Like, he, t he called the, the hotel, he called my room, and he's like, yeah, do you want to get some uh, yogurt before we go over? And I was like, uh, okay, Clint, yeah, uh, meet you in the lobby. I don't think they have yogurt at the Days Inn, but maybe there, there's, the, there's the drugstore next door. I don't, you know, like, he, there was no assistant. And, you know, it was like, he, was, it was a, he drives like his Audi from 1980. You know, like, it was crazy. And I was like, oh, I was like, oh, you can be normal and be in this profession and have that kind of success. It was a real testament to like, oh, yeah, you could choose how you want to live, no matter what. And, um, and so I really admire that about him. You know, and it's the truth. It's the total truth. It's the total truth. <laughs> it's really funny. Uh, this is a quick story. So I, I remember on the A-Team, we were doing the press tour for A-Team. Like, you know, you need security. You need security when you're going on the tour. And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, going to the hotel, there's like three guys. Okay, we're going to put your thing up there. And I'm like... And then, like, I don't, there's nothing now. I like, I, I drove here, you know, it's like, it's like, I, it's like, you don't have to like, it's like a joke. Now I'd like think it's hilarious. I can't believe I even had allowed that to happen at 18. Um, but like, you really can choose to do that, you know, and, and, uh, and meeting Clinton, watching him uh, was really wonderful to, to see. And, and just the way he directs, he doesn't, I, I took so much from him, you know, he ne he always never, he always shoots the rehearsal. I, I, I always do that. I don't, don't say action or cut. Um, and just how free he makes you feel, just open again, again, that environment of um, feeling comfortable to risk. Um, he creates that same thing. Uh, and I actually feel like he is similar to David O. Russell, oddly enough, in the fact that they both are about rhythm. You know, it's a different rhythm, uh, but it's rhythm and it's loose and it's the minute you walk onto the set, even if it's, you know, at craft service, you, you kind of got to be into the groove to go because you're going to you, you can be called to go in two seconds, especially Clint, who moves very fast. Uh, and that and Chris Kyle, right, that's yeah. yes, is one of another person that was based on someone that was alive and one of your just one of my favorite performances of yours as well, I have to Thanks. say. Thanks. You totally transformed. All right. Well, now we're going to leave the stage, but we are going to come back. But you guys are going to watch uh, a clip of this movie, Star is Born, I think, is that it? Yeah. Uh, and then we're going to come back and talk about that. It was, it was so great listening to that in the dark and being reminded of how good those scenes are, how the quiet scenes in that movie are just as good as the big the big numbers and the big singing and all the other stuff, the production that goes into it. It's what I love about this film is those quiet little moments throughout. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know, it's funny about, um, well, it's not funny, uh, but uh, <laughs> the, um, uh, I was just thinking about, I, I said Gabe Fazio, who I went to grad school, Gabe Fazio is the guy who comes up to Jackson in the bar and says, uh, let me take the picture. Um, that's the best thing about directing a movie is that because, you know, luck has played a huge part in my career, huge. And uh, Gabe Fazio was the best actor in our school. And uh, he hasn't been as lucky as I've been. And so to be able to be in a place, not charity, he's the greatest. And I was like, hey, man, can you come? Could we let's have fun and do this together? And I, he's so good in that scene. And we actually did Place Beyond the Pines together, too. 
He plays the, we're partners in Place Beyond the Pines, too. Um, and Linnell, who's the cashier, I met on All About Steve. She's a stand-up comic. And I remember thinking, oh, she would be perfect, and she just does it perfectly. Um, so, you know, that's the coolest thing in the world, man. Yeah. That's the best thing, you know, to be able to do that. And then have them come and crush it. And then you just look at the producer, you're like, see? <laughs> see? Look at my dog. My dog killed it. <laughs> you wanted some other dog? Look at that. Charlie did great. <laughs> Dog was excellent. He was great. <laughs> so this film kind of had everything in it for you. I mean, I, to me, it had, you had to be fearless. You had to be vulnerable. You had to be, you know, get outside your comfort zone. You had to become a rock star. Uh, you had to sing. You had to write. You had to learn to play guitar, piano. You took a risk on someone who wasn't an actress, uh, was this larger than life figure in this world. I don't even know how to describe Lady Gaga. Uh, it's amazing that you didn't fail. <laughs> and I know, because I was one of them, was like, why, did, why is he doing this? Oh my God, a star is born, oh my God. Uh, it's so tough, it's the fourth incarnation. We've Some people are attached to the Judy Garland, some people are attached to the one in 1937 with Janet, you know, or the Chris Christopherson one, but it spoke to you. And I, and I feel like if you had to do all of it and you never could have done this movie had you not done everything you've done up until the moment you started this movie. Oh yeah, well of course, anything you were doing, right, I, w I wouldn't be able to do this interview, if it, like this talk if we weren't, you know, yeah, of course, everything, uh, you, we're, we're made up of everything we've done before. Um, and uh, all the things we talked about led to that, to this. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, th that, that moment doing that play, that bottom I hit, being like, it'll never get this bad. It's never gotten that bad. And man, it got bad. You know, when you have that pressure of you got to make your day and the price and like, you know, I mean, so many factors that have nothing to do with creating art um, that, 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 that create a pressure. Um, but because I've been through war before in other ways, um, it, it, I was able to, you know, I knew, I knew it was like, you know what, I'm, I had the faith in myself that I could do it. Um, but you know, it's funny thinking about like things you hold on to. There were, there were years, I always felt like my real talent, I thought like maybe I should have been an agent because I always thought I was like, I can, I can always see the best in people and what they could be great for. I always felt that way. And I thought like, I know maybe I'm not really talented because, but I know one thing I know for sure is like, I can see if I meet somebody, it's like, oh, they're like, I don't know. I could always see stuff like that. I, I felt, and then I thought, oh, but then I was like, oh, but I could use it as that, that, that talent in story, telling a story because then I could ask people to come do it who I think are perfect. And, uh, and I, and I felt like I was right. You know, Andrew Dice Clay, Perfect, you know. Um, Sam Elliott. Well, that was not a hard one, you know. But like Stephanie, um, I met her. Well, I heard her sing, and then I met her, and I looked in her eyes, and it was like she could do it, no question. If she works hard, you know, we all have to work hard. That ha that's that has to happen. You don't work hard, you're, it's over. Thank God, thank God, thank God. It's hard. I'm so happy it's hard. That's the only way we can get a leg up on anybody is to work harder than them. It's the truth. Um, but if there, you see something and you're like, yes, and I was like, oh, I saw her soul and I could, and I loved her voice and I heard this idea of how I wanted Jax's voice to be and her natural voice, is a, it's a perfect combination, it's t speaking voice I'm talking about. And then like just her face and her eyes and like her energy, it was like, if I could just capture that, if that can then infuse into Allie, we're gold, you know? And it was the same thing with Dave Chappelle. I met Dave Chappelle and I was like, he has got, we've got to do this relationship that he and I have. There's some, it's perfect. And, and he's so, he's, well, he's just incredible. But, I, and I was, I wasn't wrong. I mean, I love that scene. Uh, that scene's much longer and I had to cut it down, but he's just, I just, man, I could watch that guy on camera all day long. He's just, uh, he, talk about not acting. 
I mean, when he was talking to me, I was like, holy shit, he's talking to me. He's like talking to me here. I thought I, I, thought I was going to die. When he's, like, he's like, I'm worried about you. I was like, I'm worried about me. I was like, <laughs> I was like is there something I don't know? Because <laughs> uh, you're looking at me and like now I'm worried. <laughs> like that, that kind of truth, you know what I mean? <laughs> I was like, holy shit, man. You're so good, dude. <laughs> What what did you learn about acting from being a director? Well, you know what's wonderful is I felt a lot less pressure as an actor because I wasn't trying to please somebody else. I, I didn't. There wasn't a part of my brain that was trying to figure out what that person wanted from me. I'd been literally just thinking about this right now, and that was very freeing because all I had to do, all I could do, was just explore. That was it. I was so free to explore. There wasn't a, a, a father or mother figure that I felt like I had to do the right take, getting back to Alias, doing the right way. It was like, oh, there is no right way. Yeah, there's just exploring and going as deep as you can. And um, that was very freeing. Very freeing. And I think that's why, um, and I hope that I, it's impossible because I obviously was a director, so the other actors couldn't feel that way. But I tried to create that environment for them too. And I think that me being an actor with them, in the scenes with them for most of the movie, um, that's the best shot I had at them feeling the same way I, I did as an actor on that set. How challenging was it to keep in the moment when you're thinking about how's the light on her, how's, the, how's this Easier. plane? Uh, because I was out of my head as the actor. Um, I learned that on Elephant Man. Because there were so many physical afflictions uh, that Merrick was going through that I was thinking about or had to, you know, had to work on, his emotional life and what he was going through was, was coming from here as opposed to, because so much of my head was taken up with the thing and the thing and the breathing and the nose and he didn't, this is a deviated septum and it's scoliosis, you know, and um, so that it, I never even thought about the emotional life. I just sort of created this character and then I'm talking to these actors, to these characters. Um, so for Jackson Maine, especially like when we jumped on, there's no way, uh, yeah, you know, we jumped, Jackson jumped on real stages. So we, I, Jackson, because I say that, because it wasn't me, because <laughs> I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Honestly, I hid behind that motherfucker in front of 80,000 people at Glastonbury. There's no way if you said, hey, Bradley, do you want to go sing in front of 80,000 people in the Pyramid Stage and Glastonbury Music Festival? But like, you, no, no, no. Um, but because I was like, this is the moment of the movie, this is the shot I want to get, we have four minutes to do it, Maddie's going to be here, my buddy's going to do the other camera, the sound's not right, what, we don't have four minutes? Uh, we got to go with the microphone's going to be in the shot, okay, hold on, what if they throw bottles? Well, I'll just incorporate that into the movie, okay, because it costs a lot to fly here, okay, you know what I mean? And next thing you know, I'm singing. Uh, and the same thing with Stagecoach, we had eight minutes, and it was in front of 25,000 people, and that was like big things. It was this song I had just written, this Black Guys wound up being the opening of the movie, and it was like, I want, okay, we gotta get the cameras the same. I want like dueling guitars and the thing here, and then I wanna get this around thing because this, the, 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 the arc of the, you know, all these things I'm thinking about. So the last thing I was thinking about was singing. And, um, but I'd worked hard, don't get me wrong, I'd already done all the work, but I guess what I'm talking about, I was able to let go. So uh, for me also, uh, as the actor, that director brain allowed the actor to get out of his head. Um, that's what it did for me. And that's, this is the first time that you've ever sung, right? I mean, you haven't sung yeah, it either, is. like to this level. No, it's the first time. Yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I mean, yeah. I mean, I sang gospel choir at Georgetown, but not really. Um, and you know, we took voice class in grad school. But no, I'm not a sing I was not a singer before this movie. No, I had to work like a Trojan. And I worked with this guy Roger Love in L.A., who's incredible, five days a week. And I worked with Lucas Nelson because I was terrified that I was going to fail. So that's a big motivator. You know, that's a really big motivator. Well, you. I think the. The reason why this movie resonates so much is you just believe, you just believe you two so much. You you're so vested in watching, um, in the audience. At least for me, I was like, I believed her and I believed you and I believed she was that all the way through. And it, it, I 
kept wanting it to have a different ending. It's <laughs> right. like, oh, is is he going to end it the way they 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 end this movie, or is there going to be some some different uh, twist? But oddly, I ended up feeling hopeful, mm. hopeful about, and it, it is so sad. Obviously, I'm not ruining the ending for anybody, uh, but it, it did have. Uh, it was such a love story, and I love the way you kept it so simple. And the stuff between the brothers and the stuff with the father it was like yet this simple story that just has all these layers to it. it was really excellent. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I, I'm glad you said hope because I feel that way about the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, all right, I'm going to ask some questions from some people here. Uh, I love that it's in your own handwriting, so bear with me for a second while I um, decipher everybody's. Um, well, I asked that question. Oh, that's good. All right, this is from Lauren. I watched Silver Linings Playbook after a breakup, and it actually helped me cope. I ended up watching it every day for a month. Do you have a movie that helped you at some point in your life? get over a hardship oh yeah I mean oh my gosh sometimes I didn't even know the hardship I was getting over watching it it just affected me so much I mean maybe I think movies have made made me feel like life is meaningful I think that's the, the hardship of like is life meaningful I know this is getting heavy <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but my initial response was like yeah apocalypse now did that for me I, I can't really tell you how it did it um, but I know that it gave me purpose to watch it, I felt like there was purpose in my life because I got to watch it. Um, the loneliness of the long distance runner, um, diving bell and the butterfly, I think helped me with my father who had passed away. Um, yeah, movies really do, yeah. Um, and this is from Monier. What are your three do's and don'ts for actor when directing three do's and don'ts for the actor yeah for actors when directing like what did you learn about maybe well, on for the, the other for side the, for them not to do yeah. oh i want them to do anything yeah that's like i don't want to do that tell them not to do something mm -hmm. yeah uh that's the, that's not starting it off on the right foot <laughs> Um, so, but, but like to be more specific, like what would I encourage them to maybe, you know, I would encourage them to risk, uh, listening to the other actor. Uh, I would encourage them to, uh, risk, uh, f risk failing. Um, and I would encourage them to listen to me <laughs> <laughs> and trust me. Cause I'm not going to, uh, you know, that, that, that you yeah, just trust me, please trust me that that's definitely what I asked all the actors. Just, you know, the one thing I ask you is like, once you decided to say yes to this movie, just if I, if I ask you to try something, tr really trust me to try it, please, you know? And that's the relationship, the director and the actor. It has to be that way. Otherwise, what are you doing? You know, if you're kind of like this with the director, like, I don't know, you know, that's not a great way to create art. You know, and I think that's why David, I trusted David. So, I mean, there's a lot of horrible stuff I tried. I mean, we didn't really know who Pat Solitano was. And we did like three levels of his condition uh, in the first two weeks of shooting the movie. So we would do those scenes in like three very different ways that... Um, that really in the editing room we found that balance. But you know, on the day it was, it was really weird. There's some weird stuff happened. Um, and <laughs> you know, like I remember when he calls, when he's trying to call Nikki and, um, and his dad's taking this, the, the phone away right before the cop knocks on the door. I mean, <laughs> I remember we went so crazy and the scene ended and David, after he cut, he said, well that was just the whole movie. That was the whole movie in that scene. <laughs> It's like, we can't do the whole movie in one scene. <laughs> we're like all Jackie Weaver, Bob, and I were all on the floor, <laughs> hugging each other, crying at the end of that scene. It's like, well, that, that was wonderful, but, <laughs> but that can't be the scene of the movie because there's no more movie after that. Um, so, so uh, yeah, just but listening to your director to just try anything. How much did you work with the character of Jackson Maine? When you started Star is Born, were you already... Did you did his character change at all through the process of rehearsal? Or were you pretty much dead set? Process of shooting or rehearsal? Rehearsal. Oh yeah, I mean, well, the rehearsal process. Shooting, Mike. I'm sorry, I was a little inarticulate. Um, 
I, I think that really, one of the things that stuck with me in grad school was reading Vak Tangoff, who, talk, who sort of had this talk about that rehearsal starts with like the moment you like even think about the character. So, so it, it changed, it changed all the way through the mixing of the movie, you know, depending on how like, you know, I was just thinking about that, listening to the, um, you know, we, the way that, you know, the, the choices of using those cars passing the distance of, as for rhythm of the scene and the wind blowing, using that hair and then accentuating the wind, you know, when you're telling a story as director, it's, it's hard to talk about it as an actor or director, um, because he Jackson changed throughout the process of writing him and then shooting him and editing him and mixing him, you know, um, but in, internally as an actor, um, yeah, Jackson was evolving every day. Yeah, I mean, every, every single day. Uh, but I believed I was Jackson on the first day of shooting fully. Um, and because if I didn't, we're fucked. Yeah, no, I fully believed I was him. Did I learn about him through shoot shooting? A tremendous amount, as we learn about ourselves as we, every day we get up. Um, but I believed I was him fully, full stop, no question. And, and that took a tremendous amount of work to get to that point. But I, I, I can't show up on set if I don't, I, well, I could, and then I'd be terrified, because then I'd be really faking it uh, if I don't believe it. And that was, I was terrified to play Chris Kyle, because I thought, wow, how am I going to get to a place where I, I believe I'm Chris Kyle? Um, but that's like a prerequisite for actors, you, you, you know. And I've, and, I, and I've been there when I don't believe it, and that's not a fun place to act from. You know what I mean? I mean, you know when you're like, oh, I didn't really have enough time, and... I don't know, I'm terrified and this person's scary and uh, I don't believe anything and now I'm just gonna really act, <laughs> like a lot. <laughs> and that's just not fun, you feel like you're faking it. it the, fun, the fun for us is to, to live in imaginary circumstance and believe it, right? That's, and then you just, and all of a sudden it ends and you feel like you're levitating. That's the high of acting. All right, this question's from Keeley Field. Uh, what would you tell your younger self if you were sitting in that seat at the actor's studio so many years ago? Uh, don't quit. Yeah, don't, do not quit. Um, and uh, don't listen to anybody who's going to be negative. I know that's what you're going to listen to, but don't do it. Try not to do it. I know you're not even going to listen to me because I'm being positive right now to you, but don't do it. Because it's just poisonous, and they're probably projecting onto you what about them. It doesn't have anything to do. They're probably not even thinking about you anyway, so don't even listen to it. And God, that means more today than ever before, Jesus, with social media and everything. I mean, God, it's just like, if you want to feel shitty about yourself, it, it doesn't take much, you know? So it's like, try to just put those blinders on, man. You, you don't read reviews or anything, Thank do you? Thank God. No. Yeah. I read, you know, the truth is I read one review of this movie. And it was a bad review. Yeah, <laughs> by chance or on purpose? I grew up loving this uh, this uh, uh, magazine, and I saw the font on my newsfeed, and I was like, and I just, it just like lured me in, and it just eviscerated the film. And I was like, oh my god! I was like, you know what? Good for you. You shouldn't have fucking read that review. You said you don't review. You never. Re you stop reading reviews after that play, Three Days of Rain. That's the last time I read a review, and um, but I read I read that review. But you know what? I got over it. Yeah. Rolled right off. Yeah. It didn't roll right off. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely didn't roll off. <laughs> <laughs> so now you've directed your movie, a movie uh, that you also starred in. What's next for you? Do you want to direct again? Do you see yourself acting again? I know there's a lot of things on your IMDb page that are in, in production or in the Leonard Bernstein was announced. Um, but do you have a new goal for yourself? Yeah, that's the one, yeah. Yeah, I love, I love it deeply. I can't believe I found something that I love so much. Uh, so yeah, I'm deep in it, something else I love and uh, it'll probably take four years again. But um, I'm just so happy that I found a story I wanna tell. Uh, I was never more happy than than doing this movie artistically ever, and if I could just do this the rest of my life as a as a, uh, I would be so lucky. Uh, but I like acting in it too. I love acting, so uh, and I definitely want to do plays. I think it's so important to do plays for me as an actor. Um, it's essential, you know, 
talk about like um, you know because film you know you talk about serving other masters but a play is an actor's medium and it just is I think you know because the director leaves after and the playwright is not there it's you 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 and your cast you you create the rhythm and have to carry the ball of energy every night and uh, it's just uh, there's nowhere to hide so I just think and it just makes you talk about like moment to moment reality as an actor living in the moment a play just it's, uh, there's no there's no better training I don't think um, and I just love I love this immediacy I love it I, I love it um, would you have any last advice for this crew here because that's one of the questions is from from Connor about any words of wisdom for young actor or older actor who is a who's a few years into his career um, find like-minded people uh, that you can start working and creating with and, 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 try, and try not to wait for that thing to happen. I mean, you can be waiting for that thing to happen or hoping for that thing to happen, but in the meantime, don't stop keeping the instrument, uh, you know, um, tuned up. Um, that's the key. And, and, and to be honest, you know, part of doing this Star is Born is I, I got to a place where I've... You know, there are a lot of there are wonderful directors that just don't want to work with me. And I thought, well, am I going to sit around and try to wait and write them emails, which I've written and they never written back, or am I just going to make my own fucking thing, dude? And literally, and that's what it was. That that was a big motivator. Uh, honestly, it's like, wait, I'm 40 years old, and what am I going to be doing? Just like waiting around. This is crazy. Um, so no matter what age you are, just uh, keep keep creating and find people. And if you find people, hold on to them. God, hold on to them, because uh, that's it. We need each other. All right. I have, um, there's one more question out there in the audience. I think I need it. the tall blonde in the back. You had a question? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's a little surprise attack by Laura Dern in case you oh, didn't have to hear her oh, voice. Wow. Oh, wow. Oh, there's one of the best actors yeah. alive right there. And people. I can't believe you just sat through this. Oh. You didn't. You just came in. No, I'm just kidding. No, she's been there the whole time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> uh, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit here no, it's and been a, thank talk Thank you for listening to, to this. Wow. Thank you. You guys, are, Thank you guys you. are an awesome audience. And Happy New Year.